The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned. He who does not believe in Him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received Him, to them He gave them the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man can boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Before we get into the Word of God this afternoon, let's all make sure we're in fellowship. And we do this, of course, by utilizing 1 John 1 9, which says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now we do this to restore harmony. For chance during the week or even on the way to church, you committed a sin, whether it's mental, overt, or verbal, you have the opportunity to fix that by naming your sins to God. It's not starting a relationship with Him, but it's recovering. And so the mandate in Scripture is not to grieve nor quench the Spirit. And when you grieve the Spirit, it's very difficult to get anything accomplished. Because now you, you will be operating out of the energy of the flesh. So, let's take a moment of silence and then we'll look into our, our study this afternoon. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we are grateful for giving us this opportunity to assemble together <clears throat> as believers in Christ. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to concentrate through the agency of the Spirit. Help us now, Father, as we examine your word, and we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, this afternoon we're going to look at a passage uh, in Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to zoom in on one particular verse, but what I wanted us to look at this afternoon is what I would call potential power. Potential P2 power. And uh, P2 stands for phase 2. For those of you who are familiar with the tenses of salvation, there is a phase 1 aspect of salvation, and there is a phase 2 aspect, phase 3. And so if you're not familiar with that, then uh, hopefully you'll be able to pick something up this afternoon. Corinth the Corinthian church was a, a messed up church. Uh, if you can think of a church that was living in sin and involved with all kinds of evil, then the Corinthian church should come up. And so what we're going to do is look at several uh, passages to demonstrate some of the challenges and the weaknesses that uh, they were wrestling with. So it's not going to be exhausted. It's just gonna, we're going to hit several passages and kind of see what they were going through. Okay? So here are some of the issues within the Corinthian church. In the very first chapter, notice, I plead with you. Who is he talking to? The Corinthian church. Okay, the Corinthian church, what's the next word? Brethren. Okay, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Okay? And that there be what? No divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together. So notice, see the boxes there? You speak the same thing, be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So from the very get-go of chapter 1, in chapter 1 of Corinthians, he's telling them to be of the same mind, be joined together, 
uh, speak the same thing and the same judgment. In other words, they've got to be uh, cooperating together. They've got to be working and pulling together. And he says, it's declared to me concerning you, my brethren, that by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Referring to the believers. When you go to chapter 3, notice what is going on here. Again, we're just uh, picking up a few of the passages of, of Corinthians. I, brethren, could not speak to you as what? As spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with what? Milk. Milk. And not with solid food, or some translations will render this uh, meat, right? Mm -hmm. For until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able, for you are still what? Carnal. Carnal. That's the Greek word sarkikoi, or sarkikos. <coughs> and he was calling them carnal, and the reason why he was calling them carnal was, look, notice, for where there are, what's the first one? <coughs> Envy. Where there are, what's the next one? Strife. Where there are? Divisions. divisions. So, envy, strife, and division. He's calling them carnal because of the things that he heard. There's envy going on, there's strife going on, tensions from within, fightings, and even divisions. Among who? Among you. This is the Corinthian church, this is the believers. Are you not carnal and behaving like what? Mere men. Mere men. So, quickly, there are three categories of men here. Uh, the first one is found on the bottom. Men. Okay. Anthropon, or anthropos, or mere men. What's the other category of men here? Unbelievers. Unbelievers, right? But as to carnal... You see that on the top there, and then to the left, what's that? Uh, what's that word there? Spiritual, pneumatikos, and carnal. That's that sukikos or the sarkikoi. So you've got three category of men here in chapter three. Now it's very important to understand this because the spiritual man and the carnal man. Who does that refer to? Believers. Believers. So, depending on you, you're either going to be spiritual or you're going to be carnal. And carnality, at least in here, is uh, some of the character characteristics of carnality is those who would exhibit envying, strife, and divisions. Do believers do this? Of course they do. Right? We do this. Where was this taking place? The Corinthian church. So this was their problem. And he says, when you're envying, strifing, and divisioning among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? What's another way of saying mere men? Rafi. Unbelievers. Unbelievers. This is the reason why husbands will nudge me and say, you know what, my wife is acting like an unbeliever. Or my wife is, the wife is saying, my husband doesn't act like a believer. I doubt whether or not he's really a believer. I've heard this in the past, nothing recent. Why? Because they're probably in a state of carnality. They're still a believer, but they're in sin. So this is the reason why we don't judge the external, because we can't tell on the external whether or not a person is a genuine believer or not. You don't know how many times people said, you know, my husband, my wife, this person, this guy at my work, 
You know, I see him at a bar, I see him smoking, I see him watching movies. You know, I doubt whether or not he is truly saved because he doesn't show the fruit of someone who's saved. And I would agree that some of those things are wrong, especially if, if it's uh, pushed too far. Drinking isn't a sin, getting drunk is a sin. The Bible says don't be drunk with wine, but be influenced by God the Holy Spirit. So drinking is not bad. In fact, Jesus uh, created several kegs at the wedding of Cana. Remember? Yeah. So he, he knows how to have a party. He gave them the best. So when we're going to say something, let's not say it's a sin unless we can support it with Scripture. And that's why, again, it's so important to see the three categories here. So that you'll understand that, you know, sometimes we're properly aligned to... I, I like Dr. Schaefer's explanation. He says, a spiritual person is a person who is properly aligned to God the Holy Spirit. A Christian is someone who is properly aligned to Christ, and that only takes one time. That's when a person ex exercises faith alone in Christ alone. They become adopted into the family of God, and then the righteousness of Christ is imputed upon, onto the, the person, the believer, and he or she can now have this harmonious relationship with God. But does that change their sin nature? No. Do they still sin? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so, rather than judging the external and saying, you know, well then maybe my husband or maybe my son or maybe my friend is living in carnality. Well then, good. Now, now we're able to pinpoint that there's at least three categories according to Paul. There's the spiritual man, there's the carnal man, and there's the mere man or the un unbeliever. We don't want to make the, uh, we don't want to jump to the conclusion that he was once a believer, now he's a mere man. Because there's another category. The person who is not consistently or, or living under the influence of God the Holy Spirit, he's living in sin, he's in carnality. But what does the scripture say? Who the, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He disciplines. So it's his job. He's going to spank you. He'll get you back on track. Do you remember the prodigal son? The prodigal son said, give me what, what's supposed to come to me. Even though it's a little early, give it to me anyways. He gives it to him. The father gives it to his son. The son goes out and lives it up. And if you look closely, he even spends the money with his friends, with prostitutes. And the brother brings this out and says, well, you're going to let him come back knowing what he did? And it got to the point where the son actually doubted whether or not the father would accept him back. I doubt the father will take him back, but maybe as a hired servant, because I know where all the gear is. I can run circles around all the servants. I would be the best servant. Rather than feeding the swine, I'd rather go back and work for my father. I know he won't accept me as a son. I wonder if I can get him to accept me as a servant. Do you remember the rest of the story? He came back. Did he lose anything? The only thing he lost was time. He lost the protection. He lost the comfort. He lost a lot of weight too, I'm sure. But other than that, he didn't lose the sonship. The father was watching for him and ran towards him kissed him, clothed him in purple, gave him a ring, and, and I said to kill a fatted calf, my son who was lost is now found. My son who was lost is now found. So if we're in carnality, then the thing to expect if we stay in carnality is discipline. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Rafi. I just want to go back to your point that, uh, you know, we were never told in the scripture or commanded in the scripture to go around and double check <coughs> on the people's salvation, mm -hmm. the brethren. That's not our job. No, it's not. And we were never told to do that in the scriptures. We're, we're never told to examine and test whether or not a person is truly regenerate or born again. 
Now there are certain things that we can, can notice, like if they're living in sin, then the one who's strong should come alongside and build him up or help him or her. But it's never to stomp or step or kick them on the curb and say, you know, if you don't shape up, you're out of here. No. Unless they're just down outright living in sin and in rebellion. That's a different story. There are a couple of instances where Paul says, you know, well, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his body and flesh so that his spirit will be saved. So we can see that there, there may be times when a person is stubborn, but I, I tend to believe that, you know, sometimes if we extend grace, maybe, just maybe, if we would take the time and reach out to the person, they might respond. See, in churches today, not all churches, but in some churches today, they want you to follow this, this long list of do's and don'ts. You know, I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Some of you know that I did a funeral for a, a, a young lady who was a new ager. And uh, there was like 350 people in the room. And so the mother asked me to uh, give the message. <coughs> and she said it's going to be kind of difficult because they're all new agers. All her friends were new agers. And she broke down and she said, but I know my daughter is a, is a believer. I know that, you know, when she was young, she responded to Jesus Christ in, by faith. So, you know, I have friends that keep telling me that, no, because she veered off and went into New Age and she goes into the hills and raise her hand and breathe in the, the energy and exhale the bad energy or something along those lines, that she's no longer safe. You know, because of their uh, denomination, they believe uh, you can lose your salvation. And so they told her that, you know, she's not with God. And so I went, and basically, I took a different approach. I knew that the audience was not going to be receptive much. And uh, even before I came uh, and gave the message, I was given 20 minutes. I knocked it down to 10. I said, I, they're not going to sit for 20 minutes. So I took the opposite route. I said, I'm going to condense it. I'm going to drop it down to 10 minutes. But I'm going to give them a message that hopefully will make an impact. And so I said, you know, in the, in the middle of my 10-minute uh, message, I said, you know, there's a lot of people today who are not believers in God. And I said, I don't blame them. And if you're not, I don't blame you. Because the, when I peruse the scripture, I see when, that when Jesus would speak and when Jesus would go visit people, they would follow him. They would listen to him. They would go wherever he would go to listen to him. Sometimes it's to be fed. Sometimes because they, they knew he could heal. But still, they were not against Jesus Christ. They were interested in him. Whatever he was doing, he was drawing people to himself. But 2013, 21st century, why is it that we have churches on every corner, but rather than drawing people to Christ, people are going the opposite direction. And so I put the blame on the local churches. And if you test some of the teachings, a lot of the teaching is not consistent with how Jesus would have it said or taught. And so by the time I was done, I had uh, the mother told me, you know, several people said that they appreciated what you said. And so, you know, they're kind of interested, I think, in hearing a little more about Rachel's uh, early beginnings as a Christian. <coughs> Made an impact. Not Maybe not for everybody, but at least a handful there was open because rather than uh, throw a list of, I'll give you a good example. Here's, a, here's something that I've heard before. If you want to be a Christian, back off the booze, back off the girls, back off the drinking, back off this, back off that. And then after a while, if you're consistent in the church, we'll evaluate you, then we'll allow you to be a part of the membership. 
Can you do that for six months? Three months? Six months? Then you're proving that you're a real Christian or you're, you're willing to be a real Christian. That's not what the scripture teaches. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Period. That's it. Well, what if the person goes AWOL like them? Like the ones in carnality? God knows how to take care of them. But let's get our teaching and doctrine straight. God will take care of those who step out of line. Because He loves them. Okay? So, again, look closely. There are three categories here. There is the mere men, or the unbelievers. There is the carnal man. And that's a believer who is, in this context here, exhibiting envy, strife, and divisions. And then there is the spiritual person, but none of them here in context were spiritual because of the envying, strife, and divisions. So if you're, you have a habit of being envious, in the habit of being in strife or causing division, guess which category you might fit under? You don't have to worry about that. But we all, we all teeter-totter back and forth from one to the other. We're all on the same boat here. Okay, so there's the natural man, the carnal man, which is the sarkikoi man, and then the spiritual man. And then when you get to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, there's another section here giving us a, a window into this church. Verses 3 and 5. With me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by the court system. It's not a big deal if you judge me on the external. In fact, I do not even judge myself. And when you get to verse 5, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. In other words, rather than focus on their problems, they were in the habit of judging others. And uh, we don't want to get into the same business as the Corinthian church. Paul knew that ultimately it was God who was going to assess him. Not the believers, not the Corinthians, but God himself. And when you look at verse 5 here, judge nothing before the time, it was phrased in a way that implies that they were judging what? Prematurely. So we have a tendency at times to judge. The first time we see something, and it's a, especially if it's a sin, we judge right away. And uh, this was the habit of the Corinthians here. They were judging Paul. And Paul was saying in verse 5, um, judge nothing before the time. Give it a little time. Don't rush into making rash conclusions or decisions. When you look at 1 Corinthians 5, notice, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among, among who? You. you. Who's the you, you referring to? The brethren. The brethren. So sexual immorality was among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the unbelievers or the Gentiles. And what is it that was not named? That a man has his father's wife. Who are we talking about here? The Corinthian church. The brethren. Notice. Uh, among you refers to the believers, the brethren, and throughout Corinthians, you'll see the word saint. Vernon McGee used to say, you're either a saint or an ain't. <laughs> <coughs> right? So, you're a saint at the moment of faith in Christ. But if you're not practiced, if you're living like this, you're in sin. Are you still a believer in Christ? 
course you are. But if you don't change direction, then the only thing you can expect is the discipline you have got. So the believers, the brethren, the saints, or we can call it the church. Uh, notice, Let's go back to uh, verse 1. The word reported, this translates the word akuo, which means to hear. It is found in the present tense, meaning that this is heard all the time. It is common talk, common knowledge. It's not gossip. They're not guessing. It's, it's something that can be uh, proven. It's common talk, common knowledge. This was an internal issue, and this is indicated by the words in blue, among you. This was happening within the Corinthian church. This is indicated by the words among you. This case of immorality was going on within the local assembly at Corinth. Notice uh, this, its uniqueness. The uniqueness of this immorality may be seen by noting that it was not even tolerated among the unbelievers. Imagine that. The unbelievers were shocked. Fornication was not disappro disapproved by Roman society at the time, but to live with one's stepmother was, to, to, was considered to be outrageous. The woman is not designated as the offender's mother, but rather as his father's wife. So what does that say? What does that imply? What does that tell us? They're not related. They're not related. Uh, she is to be understood also as the stepmother, it's not his mom. When you look at 1 Corinthians 5.2, it says you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. And you are puffed up. What's another word for puffed up? Proud, arrogant. Proud or arrogant. What is he saying here? Are, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned? When Paul says that they are arrogant, he does not mean that the Corinthians were proud of the sin. Notice, uh, here's another thing that's worth bringing out the, in the box here, might be taken. Notice the verb might be taken. Uh, when you look at the original text, it's in the passive voice implying that the action would have been taken by someone other than the church. <coughs> Had their attitude been right, God would have dealt with the offender. See, he's not asking them to take the person away. Notice, and you are arrogant, and you have it more. You're not disturbed by this that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you all. And because it's passive, that indicates that God would have been, would have been the one to take that person away. Sarah? Um, I don't know who else has the ESV version, but in the ESV it says, let him who has done this be removed from among you. Yes, I know. The ESV reads it like, uh, renders it like that. So Rafi? Does that also mean the taken away from you, meaning he's going to be called home? Uh, it could, because when you look at 1 Corinthians 11, um, the, uh, the consequence to sin is weak. What's the next one? Sickness. Sickness. And then the next one? Sleep. Sleep. Now, it doesn't mean taking a nap. <laughs> Coach. Well, uh, I guys have a question. Uh, uh, is it the, they're puffed up, proud, arrogant, they're not really repentful, they're, they don't really care about the sin, and because of this, uh, the Apostle Paul is telling them that they haven't mourned, 
Mm -hmm. that he who has done this might not be taken away from him. In other words, the person that's involved in the congregation at the time might not be removed because of the sin. So the congregation allowed the sin to take yes. place and was not removed. Yes. Might not be taken away from the congregation. So is that the interpretation of the passage? Well, you see what's going on here. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. Uh, they were proud in the presence of sin. Okay, so um, if they would have changed their view at this point, and rather than uh, rather than uh, ignore this, then I think uh, the might be taken away here would have uh, been fulfilled by God Himself. But because of go ahead. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, I, I say that because the Apostle Paul, uh, 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 what did he say? He disfellowshipped this person. Yes. He uh, Turned him over to ostracized Satan. him, yes. yes. Uh, but then in uh, 2 Corinthians, he repented and came back. So the Apostle Paul gave him up to Satan, mm -hmm. recognizing that the sin was not condoned by God. It was. It wasn't an unforgivable sin, but it was some. So, if we were to commit a sin like this, the congregation, the church, the saints, the brothers, the elders would hey, If you don't repent, we're going to remove you from the church, from the body. Yes. And that's exactly what the apostle Paul did. But then this person repented in Second Corinthians and came back. Right. So, is is that the application where the brothers should have removed this sin? From, from the brothers, from the saints. Yes, I think if, the, if you look at uh, Corinthians as a whole, uh, rather than, you know, like I said, and from the very beginning, the church was in, a, it was in a mess. They were all living in sin. It looks like that they were uh, practicing sin. They were living a, a lifestyle of sin. And so if they would have taken uh, steps, I think God would have stepped in in this particular verse here and removed the person from them. I mean, when you look at Corinthians 11, he does that. This is the reason why some are weak, sick, and sleep. So you can see some instances where God is going to remove the person from the congregation, uh, it's maybe temporarily, uh, or sometimes it could be for you know, forever. It could be. So, it, so when you say God would have removed, uh, it was the brothers that were being used by God to remove this person, as the Apostle Paul removed him from the church. Is, is that the application? Say, say that again? Uh, in this particular passage? In this particular passage, uh, God would have removed <coughs> this person using the brothers to do so. No, 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 no. Okay, Not even okay. the brothers to do so. And this okay. is why I said that might be taken as passive. So if the ball was hit, we don't know who hit the ball. If Freddie hit the ball, I'm the one, that's active voice, I'm the one removing, okay. uh, hitting the ball. Here, might be taken as actually passive. So it's something that occurs among them. It's not because of them, it's because of God. It's something that occurs as so, a result of So of God. God would have removed them? Yes. And how would he have done that? We don't know, it doesn't say here. Oh, okay. It doesn't say here. But yeah. what's <laughs> worth pointing out is that because it's passive, it's not, in, it's not their involvement in removing that person. God would have, but because they're arrogant and they're not mourning, uh, God didn't take them away. Now they had to do something about it. Oh, I see, I see. You see? I see what you're saying. Okay, thank you. So, Prophet, you go. Okay. Any other questions? I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You guys are familiar with this, I'm sure. Brother goes to law against brother, and that before who? Unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not accept what? That's hard, isn't it? 
Why don't we accept wrong, rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Paul speaking here. In suggesting accepting a wrong, Paul is not negating the concept of justice. The premise is this. It is better to be wronged than to do wrong. Better to be robbed than to rob. Neither is desirable, but if one is inevitable, a believer should have no trouble making a choice. So those are the guidelines from Paul himself. The next few verses, same chapter, says the following. Notice. Know you yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do these things to who? Brethren. You do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not uh, do not be deceived? Neither fornicators. What's the next one? Nor idolaters. Nor Adulterers. adulterers nor homosexuals. Nor nor thieves. thieves nor Covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And uh, men usually get, uh, they squirm when they see this verse. <laughs> Unless you can see the distinctions here. And you can uh, recognize that it's not actually um, uh, saying what you think it's saying. Um, can, can you, uh, do you have your Bible, Coach? You know, brother, I didn't. I didn't bring it. <laughs> I, I thought. Uh, Eric, do you have your Bible? Can you read verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1? And then, uh, Ted, do you have your Bible? Verse 8, <coughs> chapter 6. And then Rafi, yeah. verse 9. So that uh, if you're a visitor here, You'll know that, uh, what this is talking about here. I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the verse that usually gets people all uh, uncomfortable is verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And there's this list of sins. So Eric, you have verse yeah. 1? When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare not go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge? Do you just want one? Or? Yes, one. Okay, sorry. It's okay. So that word unrighteous there, it's the, out of the three verses here, the verse 8 and verse 9, verse 1 has the article in front of it, uh, in front of unrighteous. You don't see this in the English, but in the Greek text. Uh, it has an article, and when it does, it speaks of identity. So the unrighteous there is the unbeliever. So it's referring specifically to unbelievers. Are you willing to go in front of the unbelievers uh, to help you sort through your issues in court? Look at verse 8. Um, who has verse 8? Edda? Uh, on the contrary, you yourselves wrong and be fraud. Okay. Do this even to your brethren. So the do wrong here is from the Greek word adikeo, from adikos. And uh, that's uh, unrighteousness when you do wrong. Okay, but there's no article here. It's not like verse 1. Okay? And then Rafi. Verse? Mm -hmm. uh, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay. Do not be, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexual, nor sodomites. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or nor extortionists will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. That word unrighteous in verse 9, you see it right there in verse 9? That's also adikos, but it doesn't have the article. And when it doesn't have the article, it stresses the character or the quality of that person. Mm -hmm. So it's not linking them to a particular identity. So it's not unbelievers in verse 8 or 9, 
It's believers who are doing wrong, believers who are behaving in an unrighteous manner. Well, when you compare it with verse 1, the word unrighteous there speaks of a particular category of people. So you've got the category of unbelievers, and then you've got the category of believers who are living or behaving in an unrighteous way. Okay? So these guys will not inherit the kingdom of God. And one more thing. Uh, Rafi, Matthew 21, 31, and 32. Matthew 21, mm -hmm. 31, 32. Okay. okay. Oh, I have it in my phone, brother. <laughs> Cheating, Rafi. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 21, yeah, 31 and 32. Which of the people? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Okay, so. More? No, that, that's okay. Um, yeah, read, oh, go, go ahead, read the following. Okay. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed in him, believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Okay. So notice that who is going to enter the kingdom of God? Harlots and tax collectors. What's a, to be clear, what is a harlot? Prostitute. 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 She sells her body. Or nowadays, he sells his body. What are they going to do? They're going to enter into the kingdom of God. But in here, what's the word? Inherit. Inherit. That's another study. <laughs> but inherit and entering speaks of two different things. Okay? So the ones in here who are believers will not inherit if they behave like this. Okay? So it's not referring to getting into heaven. Because most men say, oh, is this really true? If I... If I look at verse 9, um, will God really prevent me from getting into heaven? It's not saying that. It's talking about what? What's the word you're entering? No, inherit. It's inheriting the kingdom. Two different words, two different studies. It'll require some time. Now, if you think about it, why would believers think unbelievers would inherit the kingdom? He says... Uh, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Are you surprised that unbelievers will not inherit the kingdom? No. 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 So it can't be referring to unbelievers. Right. Rafi, you were going to say something? No, it's just another study to differentiate inherit and enter because a lot of people are confused about the difference in both. Yeah. They are, there's, there's a, it makes for a good study. We looked at this a few years ago. But for this uh, particular study today, we're not going to be able to go into both. Uh, when you look at 1 Corinthians 10, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. And so, you know, when you look at verses 14 to 22, uh, Paul raises the question as to whether believers should participate in feasts, in idol temples. So, you know, when you look at uh, chapter 1 to 14 and even to t up to 22, it's, it's referring to the, uh, the subject as meat uh, being offered to the idols. And uh, you can look at that on your own when you have the chance. So again, I'm just uh, highlighting some of the, the things that they were going through. So going back to the opening of, of my message, potential P2 power, phase 2 power. Why do I say potential? It's because we don't always have it. We have to be in uh, cooperation with God and His Word. It's not something that's automatic, because if it is, then none of us would struggle. Right? If we are, if all believers will behave, if all believers will live a life consistent to the Scripture, or with the, uh, according to the Bible, then why have all these mandates in Scripture? Why have all the why have the commands in Scripture? It still requires our volition. We have to exercise our free will. 
This is the reason why I said it's potential P2 power. Now take a look at this slide here. This is important because salvation comes in three tenses. And it could be uh, when you, you look at the first salvation, the category of salvation is, what is it called? Justification. Justification. And then the phase two salvation, which is called? Sanctification. Sanctification. And phase three salvation is glorification. Salvation just simply means deliverance or to be delivered. Right? If you have a, an illness, you could be delivered from that. God could deliver you from an illness. You could be delivered from your enemies. You could be delivered from uh, the penalty of sin, which is phase one. So take a look at this again. So it's a past tense salvation. Uh, which we would call phase one. Then there's the present tense, which is what we're talking about. This is potential, uh, which is sometimes called um, sanctification. And then a future salvation, which is phase three, where we are no longer in the presence of sin. Uh, so I have been saved from what? <coughs> penalty, penalty of sin. That takes place at the moment of faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. So if you act for yes to Jesus Christ, he who believes in me has everlasting life. So you're no longer, it's no longer a sin issue for you. In fact, it's no longer a sin issue today because Jesus Christ took care of it. If a person dies, it's not because they're, a, if they are eternally <coughs> separated, it's not because they're a sinner or, you know, they're, they live a life of all kinds of evil and sin, it's because their names were not written in the book of life. They have not believed in Jesus Christ. Um, when you look at the phase two salvation, I am what? Saved. Being saved from the what? Power of sin. We struggle with sin, do we not? Yes. This is why it's potential. We're either walking by means of the Spirit, there's a host of verses, walking by means of the Spirit, or we're not. The energy of the flesh. If we're walking by means of the Spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. It's an absolute. I am being saved from the power of sin. And then phase three, I will be saved from what? The presence of sin. So what's that look like? Yeah, it's in the future when we either, our, our life terminates here or the rapture takes place. Our Someone asked you, brother, are you saved? So the answer is those, underline those three. Yes. And I would say saved. I'm, I'm phase one, I'm saved as far as my justification and I'm daily uh, Sanctified. being sanctified. Yeah. <coughs> and I will be saved. But that's why I put it on the bottom. I have been saved. I am being saved. And I will be saved, which is in the future. It's very good. So when you look at each one, again, the, the first one is free. Uh, salvation is a gift, right? For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a yep. gift of God, not of works. So that no one can boast. It's a gift. You don't, the moment, if, if I give you my laptop, and then tomorrow you start scrubbing my shoes, waxing my car, <laughs> it's no longer treated as a gift. Now you're working for it. A gift is a gift. You just receive it. And same way with salvation. Salvation is free. But when you look at sanctification, it's costly. And if you blur the two together, it can get confusing. I'll give you a good example. Okay, we're going to play the organ until everybody gets off their chairs and go, comes down the altar. You have to pick up your cross and follow me. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. Guess what? That's not justification. It's not referring to justification. And yet altar calls and people, when they say, you know, uh, come off off your seats, come forward, we're going to keep playing this tune until everybody, you know, uh, picks up their cross to follow Christ. 
Those are discipleship passages. Those are phase two passages. Those are costly passages. That's the stuff that you and I are to work for. In phase one, it's not about you, it's about him. In phase two, it's all about you operating under his influence and in his empowerment. So that if you recognize how sanctification works, then you're living under his empowerment once you're able to utilize the verses and scriptures together. Romans 12, 2, don't be like the world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Passive voice again, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our job is to get into the Word. Transformation occurs as you get into the Scripture. Not because you're trying. There's no amount of energy on, on, on you that can execute the spiritual life. Remember, if you can do it, we don't need the Holy Spirit. But if we've, if, we've been, if we've been given the Holy Spirit, we have to ask ourselves some serious questions. What does it mean now that we have God, the Holy Spirit, resident in us? Is He just there for the ride? No, he's, one of His primary objectives is to help us when we have sin issues, when we have thought issues, when we have verbal issues, sexual issues, stealing issues, alcohol issues, drug issues. God has provided resources through the Holy Spirit to empower us so that we could be transformed, no longer looking like the world. But when we, we blur sanctification and justification, pick up your cross, come forward if you want Jesus, you're taking things that are somewhat difficult for an unbeliever, someone who has no power, it's not unregenerate, and you're making demands on them so that they can be a believer. Now, let me, let me be clear. When it says pick up the cross, when it says love your enemies, those belong after salvation. You don't put it in the front. I'm all for putting it in the middle because that's where it belongs. That's when you have the power to live those things out. But when someone is struggling with dope, alcohol, whatever, and you tell them that, you know, in order for God to accept you, you have to first stop. <laughs> How can they stop when they don't have the ability to do so? This is the reason why we have the Holy Spirit. So that once we taste this and we can see that it is possible to have victory when we cooperate with Him and His Word, we can make an impact to those outside of these doors. But the reason why they're not convinced is because they see us living defeated lives. Why should I listen to you when you're struggling with me? You're doing the same thing I'm doing, but you're better at hiding it. <coughs> Nobody here is immune to sin. But if you're wrestling with a sin issue, you've got to tap into P2. <coughs> and we're going to look at that in just a moment. Rafi. Actually, uh, the biblical word spiritual, mm -hmm. if you guys really go back, the root word is spirit. It's of the Holy Spirit. Yes. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. You know, so it's not it's not Rafi's spirit. It's not Rafi's fruit. It's it's the fruit of God the Holy Spirit. Again, uh, showing the importance of uh, cooperating with Him. And then phase three, of course, uh, is when we are no longer here. We we either pass from this life or we are raptured. So the first uh, tense of salvation refers to what? How we become a Believer. Believer. Mm -hmm. See, we don't do anything. It's already been done. It's not about impressing God. It's not about being good. It's not about sinning less. It's about acquiescing to someone who is perfect and is availing himself as a gift. And once we have the gift and once we have his righteousness, we are supplied with power. And that power comes from not our will, but God the Holy Spirit. So phase one refers to how we become a Christian.
phase two where it's hard, where it takes commit, it requires commitment, picking up the cross, loving your enemies. That's discipleship. Arnold. When we are saved from the power of sin, does it seem that the sin nature during justification will diminish in sanctification? Or is it the same power? Uh, the same sin nature in phase one is still there in phase two. So it's just you don't the lose. Yeah. You just had the Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. You, nothing is removed. Mm -hmm. Something has been added, okay. which is God Himself. So, if you have sin issues, we all do, then we have to figure out and we have to learn how to live out phase two. We have to uh, live transformed lives as a result of renewing our minds. And uh, we'll see in 1 Corinthians 15 in just a moment as well. Uh, let's move on. And then glorified body. So phase one deals with being a Christian. Phase two deals with being a disciple. Phase three deals with glorified uh, bodies. We don't have to worry about justification because that's already taken place at the moment of faith. Our objective here and now is phase two. Phase three will come on its own. Phase two is something we need to... to uh, to live out uh, as far as our, our spiritual life as a disciple. A couple more things here. Notice um, some key doctrines in phase two. Okay? Something worth bringing out. As far as uh, phase two salvation, when we are dealing with things with relate, uh, that relate to the flesh, if we have issues with the flesh, we've got to... Uh, Research the passages that talk about walking by means of Him, dependence upon Him. Okay? So there are certain things in the Bible which address different things for our phase two salvation. For example, abiding in Him, John 15. What will that do? That will help us be productive, that will help us be fruitful. As we abide in Him, and He abides in us, we bear much fruit. Right? So abiding in Him will influence or affect our fruit or productivity. Uh, resting in Him. This is kind of, the last one is reciprocal. As we learn how to rest, some will use the term faith rest. Um, our faith rises. Our confidence in Him <clears throat> rises. I've used this example before. The Christian, some will say, well, I have difficulty really trusting God. You know, I haven't had major events in my life. I haven't, I, I haven't really, you know, I don't know how to trust Him. Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God, right? But as far as... You know, it's one thing to be able to quote the scripture and say, oh, you've got to trust, brother. You've got to have faith in God. But it's quite another for you to actually experience it. Okay? So you've got to know what it looks like in your life as far as trusting Him. And the only way that that's going to come is when you spend time and develop that relationship with Him. There are some of you that I know quite well, and I can actually say that I trust you. And there are some that I don't really know well. I don't know if I can trust you. What's the difference? Time invested. As I get to know you, my trust and confidence in you, what? Right. Will grow. So when people say, uh, I, I want to trust God, I'm trying to trust God, I'm, I'm putting my faith in God, if they're divorced from this, how are they going to be able to accurately trust God when they're not spending time with God? The natural byproduct of time with someone is trust. Especially if we're talking about trust and confidence in that person. Sometimes as we get to know the person, we can honestly say, I don't trust that person. But the only way you'll ever know is if you first spend time with that person. Mm -hmm. Now when we talk about God, you need to spend time with God through His Word. 
so that you can honestly say, I trust him. Is that not what Romans 10, 17 is about? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. But I'm trying to trust God. I don't have time to study, but I'm trying to trust God. That's like trying to trust someone you don't know. How can you trust someone you don't know? You can't. Only as you involve yourself with that person will you be able to know without a shadow of a doubt if he's trustworthy. And guess what? Once you get to know him, Genesis all the way down to Revelation, you'll be able to discover firsthand that he's trustworthy. So don't just preach it or don't just quote it chapter and verse. Utilize it in your life. And this will come naturally as you get into His Word. And as you wake up each and every day. Because you're going to get hit with challenges. Right? So walking, abiding, resting. Resting, you get to rest. You get to trust. Your faith goes up. Don't be worried about anything. But in everything, prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. will guard your hearts and minds of Jesus. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding will be yours. And if you have peace and you can understand it, that's not the peace in Philippians 4. Because you understand that you've contributed to that. Maybe you know someone and they, they helped you. But when you're going through a crisis that nobody knows, and you're able to say, while you're by yourself, that you know under normal circumstances I would hit the panic button, but I'm not sure why I'm okay, but... Uh, it might be because of my relationship with God. It's, it's, it's strengthened because of my study time with Him. I'm learning more and more to trust Him. And then He guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. A couple more slides and then we're done. In the opening of chapter 1, I want you to zoom in closely and notice. Um, the message of the cross is foolishness. Moriah is the Greek word for foolishness. To those who are what? But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And he's talking to the believers, right? Those who are being saved. Is that phase one? Phase two? Phase three? Phase two. It's referring to our sanctification. To those, to us, he's including himself, who are being saved. Not that, are they saved at this point? Yes. 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 So it's not phase one salvation, it's got to be phase two. phase two. It can't be phase three, because he's talking to them. Alive. Still there. So, who are being saved, it is the power of God. What's the power of God? The Word of God. The Word of God to us, the believer who is being saved or delivered, P2, is the power of God. Notice what it says here in Jeremiah. Maybe you've read this before. We'll quote an Old Testament passage. It is not my word like a fire. It says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. So the message of the cross is silly or foolishness to those who are unbelievers. You ever talk to an unbeliever? Hey, you, you know, um, did you know that uh, by believing in Christ you can have everlasting life? Uh, don't, don't push your religion on me. Uh, I'm not interested. I used to go to Sunday school, but now I'm educated. <laughs> it's foolishness to those who are unbelievers. They're dichotomous, body and soul. But as we've learned in the past, believers are trichotomous. We have the human spirit, which allows us to understand the living word. 1 Corinthians 2. So it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us it's what? Power. Power. Don't forget. What's power to us? The message, of the, the message of the cross or the word of God. Does not Hebrews say the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword? 
How often are you using that? How often are you taking it in? How often are you studying it? I'm not talking about bestsellers on the Christian you know, bookstores. I'm talking about the scripture. So the word of God is power for the believer. The perishing view of the cross is foolishness. The Greek word here is Moriah. carries two ideas with it. Uh, first, it refer, refers to anything that does not appear to fit the framework of human logic. Second, it refers to anything that is considered to be the product of a feeble mind. We've looked at Romans 1 before, and I'm under the impression, that my, my personal take on verse 16 is it's more of phase 2. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you have a chance to look at 18 to 32, they, people there are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness and in ungodliness. And God's wrath was being revealed and is being revealed even today. Mm -hmm. And so when Paul wrote this, no, what does he say? I am not what? Ashamed. I'm not ashamed. ashamed. Thus uh, suggesting that they were ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is what? Oh, what's the power of God? The gospel or his word to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek. It's phase two. It can't be phase one, and it can't be phase three. Now, some will say, I think it's phase one. It's okay. Um, I, I can see why they would be comfortable with that. But like I said, when you look at the, the, next, the, the rest of the context, uh, Paul... Uh, develops this whole idea that because people are suppressing the truth about God, God gives them over to themselves. And then you see the homosexual behavior. God turns them over to themselves. Women with women, men with men. Why are they doing this? Because God turned them over to themselves. God turned them over to a debased mind to do these things that are unfit. So when you go back to verse 16, Paul's saying, hey, you guys in Rome, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's power. It's the power of God, which you guys are not exhibiting. You guys are spiraling downwards. Look at 18 to 32. There's a host of sins there. Could it be because they're ashamed? We know it's because they're suppressing the truth. But did it start because they were ashamed? That's my thoughts. Rob? Uh, these three tenses of salvation will cover it in depth in the HBI class. Yes, for soteriology. Thursday? Yes. Soteriology? Okay. okay, so almost done. Let me just read uh, our chapter now. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained uh, to the present. They were still alive at the time of this writing. But some have fallen asleep, dead, uh, but believers. After that he had been seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Now, when you jump to verse 12, same chapter, you discover why Paul is writing this. This is not a gospel presentation. He's not showing people how to be saved. Because they're already saved. And we'll look in just a moment again. But notice what he's saying, what he says in verse 12. If Christ is preached that he has been what? Raised from the dead. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. 
And if Christ is not risen, then your preaching is, our preaching is empty, your faith is also empty. What's going on here? Hmm. Prophet. I guess some of the believers in the Corinthian church don't believe that he was raised from the dead. That's right. They didn't believe in the resurrection. So Paul brings this back in full circle. And he says, we've taught you this before. I've taught you this before. How is it that some of you say that there's no resurrection? That's important to see. And I think this is the reason why he brings this out in the opening of this chapter. Let's zoom in. This is our last verse here. Our last slide. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, in which, by which also you are saved, what? If. It's a conditional clause, third, third class condition. If you do. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. You will be saved or delivered if you hold fast the word. Which I preach to you. So notice. Salvation or deliverance from the sins mentioned in this book will come as a result of holding fast the word. Okay, the, word the verb are saved is present tense. And this means you are being saved, which basically means it's phase two. We already know that they're believers. They're saints, not aims. But their job is to hold fast to the word. So that they can be saved from what? Our Some of the issues uh, that we just covered. Remember the things I brought out? The issues and struggles and the sin that they were wrestling with? When you get to the very back end, the tail end almost of 1 Corinthians, deliverance comes as a result of holding fast, keeping, retaining, taking possession, or staying in the Word. Coach? Real quickly, uh, one of the things the Apostle Paul dealt with was, uh, as the Apostle John dealt with, was Gnosticism. Yes. Uh, was taught that the, the body of Christ did not rise. That's right. That's right. Now, why is this important to see? Why did I bring out 12, verse 12 and 13? Because some will have you to, to believe that is, it is imperative to include the cross and the resurrection. I think it is important to include the cross and the resurrection. But I make the distinction between, listen closely, between his words and his works. His words offer eternal life. He who believes in me has everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. His works validate who he was. It gives us the confidence that one day we too will be resurrected. That we have the same power that raised Jesus Christ resident in our lives. Well, Pastor Freddie, are you saying you, you don't think it's important to, to preach the cross? No. I believe it's important to preach the cross. But I'm going to introduce two things. The words of Christ which offer life, his works, to raise the confidence, to elicit a response in the one I'm talking to so that they, that he or she will respond. What does John 20, 30, 31 say? These things were written, the purpose of John, these things were written, the things refer to the signs. How many signs? Eight, Eight signs. These things were written that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you can have life in His name. Can a person get saved with the words of Christ? No. Yes. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. How does one become born again? Believe. John 3, coach. I was going to say, I said no, because if the salvation is contingent mm -hmm. upon not just believing, but you have to accept Christ. The, the demons believe and shudder. So, uh, uh, salvation is contingent upon all those who believe 
Yeah. If you do not believe in Christ, of course, His words give us life. But if you don't believe those words and trust and, and act upon those words, you don't get salvation. I'll answer that. Let's go to uh, the James 2, and then we'll close it. That's a very good question. It comes up every so often. I guess I'm wrong. Oh, no, we'll, we'll look at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Uh, it's a very good question. Very good question. A few more minutes. If you look at James 2, Verse 14. Let's get some context. I, 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 um, I appreciate that question because it's a, it's a question that's often raised. And I think uh, hopefully we can see something here. What does it profit? Are you there, Coach? James 2.13. 2.14. 14. I'm here, brother. Okay. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, if one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it benefit or profit? Right? So we are supposed to have actions. We're supposed to have works. Faith without works, or what does it say? If someone says he has faith and he does not have work, can faith save? Now, what's the word save mean? Deliver. 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 And then what follows after that are a brother and sister who is destitute of daily food. So if you come to my door and you say, hey, um, my family is in need. Uh, you got any uh, change? You got some food that uh, you can give us? Um, I'm in the middle of a Bible study. Uh, I'm in the, can, can, can you guys come back later? I'm Skyping with people. Now, what profit is there? If I turn my back to these people, none. Is that salvation phase one? No. no. Phase two. My faith is not productive at this point. It does no good to these people, and I'm mishandling the text. I'm full of doctrine, but I'm not applying the doctrine. Mm -hmm. Roughly. Yeah, you know, well, you're saying your faith is not productive. No. But you still have faith. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So faith without works, you still have faith. And that's what this guy had. If a brother or sister comes and they're in need and you don't help, what profit is there? There's none. Okay? Moving forward. <clears throat> Verse 17. Thus faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You ever have a uh, coach? What kind of car do you drive? Uh, a Hyundai. Okay. Sonata. Has it the battery ever died on that? Uh, yes. Okay. Did your car vanish after that? It did. We got a we got a headlight. No, it just didn't work. It didn't turn over. So the battery was dead. Dead. When you have a battery that's dead, can you take your wife to the movies, to the mall? No. The mall? That's good for nothing. You still have a car. Yeah. True. But it's useless. True. So when you look at this, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. Useless. 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 As seen in the, the people who are in need. They have faith, but they're not applying the things that they know to help. Okay? So faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is useless. Not, it doesn't say, it, it's not referring to unbelief. It's just dead. It's still faith. Someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Read verse 19, coach. This is your verse. Oh, my Oh, we'll talk about this later. <laughs> <laughs> you brought it up. Oh, I did, I did. No, no, it's all good, too. I love it. It's in uh, 19, right? Yes. You believe that God is one. Is this correct? Like yeah, that's it. Keep okay. going. Okay. Uh, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. 
Okay, that's the verse that you're quoting. <laughs> now, why would the demon shudder? According to verse 19. Oh, verse 19? Yeah. Why are the demons shuddering according to verse 19? Mm -hmm. what, did he, what did James say here? He says, you believe that God is one. You do well. And? The demons also believe. Believe what? That God is one. Okay, what is that? What did JW's cults believe in plurality of gods? Uh, JW's don't. But well, correct. Well, do. they say Jesus is a god. They think he's Michael the Archangel, yes. Yeah. Um, so in here, the demons tremble because they know God is one. Correct. What do we call it when we believe that God is one? Who knows? Monotheism. Monotheism. True. Monotheism is one. Okay. Why is that important? Because in, in, in spite of all these false gods being taught and pushed and, and, and uh, these religions and systems out there even during this time, they know that God is one. It causes them to tremble. So when we say that even the demons believe, the demons believe in context that God is one. So we don't say that, oh well, all you know, you gotta believe, you gotta accept, you gotta do this. Because if we stick with the text here, the demons believe that God is one and causes them to tremble. tremble. So contextually. <coughs> The reason why they believe. And what is it they're believing in? God one God. That's not salvation. I don't preach, you have to believe that God is one. I, I preach John 3.16. And that's very, very important to know. Because if you if you take this... Well, coach, let's close because uh, we're oh, out. Go ahead, go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, uh, I'll, I'll I apologize for the delay, but uh, this is what happens every so yeah, often I'm sorry. with good questions. Oh, um, <laughs> Father, we are grateful for giving us this opportunity to uh, examine your word and thank you for <coughs> revealing to us the potential power that's ours as a result of the scripture. And Father, of course, we're not talking about just uh, storing it up in our minds, but Lord, to make application to the doctrines that we study together and even on our own time. Father, we recognize that, uh, as Paul had mentioned, that there's power in the message. For the unbelievers, it's foolishness, but for us, it is the power of God. We know that uh, Paul was not ashamed because it was the power of God. We can see in 1 Corinthians 15 that they would receive the power, they would be saved if they held to the word, which was conditional. So that means, Lord, that we have to make a decision <coughs> to choose to hold fast to the word of God, that we might be saved, phase two. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you.